The WCC head coaches picked Gonzaga second in the WCC behind St. Mary's. And you know what? Feels kind of good to be the underdog. We're going to talk about that as well as our Ryan Nemhard player preview series all coming up on today's Locked on Zags. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Well, folks, we are continuing our player preview series today, discussing every player on Gonzaga's roster. We're going to look at their history, how they ended up in Spokane, as well as their best and worst case scenarios for this upcoming season, followed by a more realistic role prediction and a look towards the future. We started with Ben Gregg on Wednesday's episode of Locked on Zags, and now we're closing out the week talking about Ryan Nempard. But before, really quickly... The WCC media days are happening as we're recording, as we're speaking right now. The coaches poll came out and Gonzaga was picked second. Five first place votes went to St. Mary's. Four first place votes went to Gonzaga. That didn't happen very often. And I don't plan to get all the way into it. We've had lengthy conversations on Locked on Zags about Gonzaga, about St. Mary's, about the battle between the two of them. St. Mary's has a little bit more continuity. Then Gonzaga does. They lose Logan Johnson and Kyle Bowen. Gonzaga loses, of course, Drew Timmy, Julian Strother, Bolton Smith, uh, most of their bench depth. So I can actually understand why the coaches might prefer St. Mary's over Gonzaga this year. But I got to tell you, it feels pretty good to be the underdog. And I hope more than ever before Gonzaga ends up getting that first place nod, as they typically do. But it's going to be a little bit sweeter when there are plenty of folks out there who don't think they're going to do it this year. Let's get into our player preview, though. We're talking Ryan Nempard today, of course, Gonzaga's new point guard of the future. Nempard, six-foot point guard out of high school. He was a four-star coming from Montverde Academy, the same high school as his older brother, Andrew. And yeah, we're going to talk about Andrew Nempard a lot on this podcast, hence wearing the Andrew, Andrew Nempard Indiana Pacers jersey, for those of you watching on YouTube, because they're brothers. And there's comparisons there, some natural, some that, that maybe are a little unfair, but it's going to be a part of the conversation. Ryan Nembhardt, of course, did not go to Gonzaga out of high school. Neither did Andrew. Ryan ended up going to Creighton and immediately started. As a freshman in that 21-22 season for the Blue Jays, Nembhardt averaged 11.3 points, 4.4 assists, 3 boards, and 1.3 steals. He was an immediate, instant contributor for the Blue Jays, a good Creighton team. They were even better the follow-up year, but Nembhard proved that he is a high-level power six starting point guard right out of the gates in that first season with the Blue Jays. Not the most efficient score that year, just under 46% on two-pointers, only 31.1% from deep, but he was, again, instantly good. 15 points and 10 assists in his first game folks, his first college game, putting up a a double-double against Arkansas Pine Bluff. In his third game, first Power 5 game against Nebraska, 22 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 assists. When it matters, Ryan Nempard shows up. That's going to be a huge part of his story at Gonzaga, no doubt. But unfortunately for Ryan, his freshman season ended early. He still got into 27 games, all starts. Again, was in that starting lineup right out of the gates. Uh, But he suffered a wrist injury against St. John's in February, uh, missed the rest of the season. It was on February 27th, so he missed the Big East tournament, missed uh, the NCAA tournament, really hurt Creighton that he was not able to produce for them down the stretch. But healed up over the offseason, came back for Creighton as a sophomore, and improved in every single way. He was one of the the best point guards in college basketball for the Creighton Blue Jays last year. Uh, Points per game bumped up to 12.1, assists bumped up to 4.8, boards up to four rebounds per game, 37 games all starts, played 34 minutes per game. He was about 35 minutes per game as a freshman, so Creighton rode him hard in his two years there. He was playing just about every minute of those basketball games. You also saw improvement in efficiency, 
going from his freshman year to his sophomore year, which is pretty typical, went from just about 46% on twos to a little over 48% on two-point shots, and his three-point percentage came from 31 to 35.6. He also dropped his turnovers per game from 3.1 as a freshman, which was a tad alarming, although freshman point guards turn the ball over a lot. Uh, he dropped that all the way to 2.1. So again, Assists bumped up just a little bit from his freshman year to his sophomore year, but he dropped his his turnovers by an entire turnover per game. That's a huge improvement to make year over year for Ryan Nemhard. A couple other uh, performances to kind of shout out for him. 25 points, six rebounds, five assists versus Arkansas in the non-conference. Again, his best games typically come against high-level opponents. That is who this guy is. Uh, that is why it is so exciting to have him uh, in Spokane in the Gonzaga uniform. Uh, he had four double-doubles during the season, all strangely enough with rebounds. Ryan Nemhart is six foot tall, and for him to get multiple games where he's posting double-digit rebounds is a, a testament to his mentality, his workhorseness, uh, a little bit about the ability to get those rebounds and turn and get out and transition, something that I know Gonzaga and Mark Fiore are going to really want him to do and something he's proven more than capable of doing during his first couple of seasons. He nearly had a triple-double against Xavier, uh, 11 points, 10 rebounds, and eight assists. And then perhaps the most notable game of his career, one of the last ones he played, most recent ones he should play, a 30-point explosion against Baylor in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Creighton was the three seed, Baylor was the six seed, and, or excuse me, flip that, Creighton was the six seed, Baylor was the three seed, and Creighton came in defeated Baylor, pulled off the upset, although a lot of people weren't sure if it was really an upset. Baylor had been fading down the stretch just by getting that three seed. Meanwhile, Creighton really had one horribly bad stretch of games early in the season because of a, an injury and sickness for Ryan Kalkbrenner. Most people thought they were pretty underseeded as a six seed. They proved that by going to the Elite Eight. Uh, and again, Ryan Nempard, 10 of 10 from the free throw line, efficient shooting from outside, and just dropped a 30-burger on the Baylor Bears. A poor defensive team, mind you, but still impressive nonetheless to get to do that. Unfortunately, the last play of his Creighton career uh, was a, a somewhat controversial one, but one that ultimately ended up resulting in a loss for the Blue Jays. He committed a foul on Darion Trammell, the point guard at San Diego State. Did look like he got him a little bit, a play that was maybe a little unnecessary for him to do. Trammell goes to the free throw line, hits the free throw of San Diego State, ultimately advances to the final four. And of course, Lamont Butler uh, jump shot, and then they advanced to the national championship game where they, like everybody else in the NCAA tournament, got beat quite badly by the UConn Huskies, who ultimately won the entire thing. After that, Ryan Nimhard somewhat surprisingly entered the NCAA transfer portal. You don't see a lot of guys entering the portal who played 35 minutes per game for a team that was perennially ranked in the top 25 that went to the Elite Eight. That is unusual. When Ryan Nemhart entered the transfer portal, and I mean like the minute that it was announced that Ryan Nemhart entered the transfer portal, everybody said Arizona. He's going to Arizona. He's going to play for Tommy Lloyd. You know, Tommy and, and Andrew were close when, when Nemhart was playing at Gonzaga. Arizona needed a point guard because at this time, Kirk Rita had already entered the transfer portal and committed to West Virginia. Of course, Gonzaga needed a point guard as well because Nolan Hickman just didn't cut it last year and it's going to be shifted to an off-the-ball role, but everybody said it's Arizona. Nemhart ultimately took visits to Spokane. He took visits to Tucson. And everybody thought because he left Spokane without committing and he went to Tucson, everybody thought, well, he's going to commit to Arizona because he's going to Tucson. Usually if you don't get a commitment while the kid's on campus, that is going to cost you. But instead, Mark Few, a huge heist, a massive victory for the Bulldogs as Ryan Nemhard commits to Gonzaga, following in his brother's footsteps in a really shockingly similar way, having spent two years at a different program, then transferring and coming straight to Gonzaga. Nemhard was, Andrew was, of course, at Florida. Ryan now looking to do the same thing at Gonzaga. And now that's what we're going to talk about. Can Ryan Nemhard replace Nolan Hickman in theory, but also can he be an Andrew Nembhard type point guard for Gonzaga? Because that's what they need in the post Drew Timmy era. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his awards. Can he win WCC player of the year? What are those best and worst case scenarios for Nembhard entering his junior season and his first in Spokane? We'll talk about it after a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. These days, Every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best, most qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs because LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. 
It's so easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn jobs, and then you just add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. Because honestly, right now, hiring the right team member can have a positive and measurable impact on your business. And that's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners checking out the show on YouTube. Shout out to those of you who are checking out the player preview series as well. This is number two in what will be a multi-part series discussing every player on Gonzaga's roster. We talked Ben Gregg on Wednesday's show. Go back and check it out. There's a whole YouTube playlist of them uh, for you to look at as well. But we're talking Ryan Nembhard today, and we're talking best and worst case scenario. And I'm going to say this caveat in every show. That's best case within reason, worst case without injury. If it's not reasonable for a player to win the WCC Player of the Year or National Player of the Year, we're not going to discuss that as a best case scenario. Similarly, injuries are not particularly noteworthy discussion wise. The worst case scenario for any player is they get hurt and can't play. That doesn't need to be discussed. If an injury is a part of a player's history, like certain players on Gonzaga's roster, it will come up in that conversation. But ultimately, we're trying to focus on the best and worst case scenarios on the basketball court. So let's talk Ryan Nembhard. The best case scenario for Ryan Nembhard is that he thrives in Gonzaga's up-tempo, pick-and-roll heavy offense, similarly to his brother Andrew. He gets to Gonzaga. He gets to play in this this more up-tempo kind of – there's a reason that in Gonzaga and Arizona were the places he looked. That's kind of what he wanted. He wanted an opportunity to be more of a point guard, to be more of a free-flowing offense. And in the best-case scenario, that allows him to be a better version of the player we saw at Creighton, who was already pretty darn good. Best-case scenario is Ryan Nemhardt's ability to navigate pick-and-rolls is elite. And the best-case scenario is that he is the best point guard in the country. Tyler Kolek at Marquette. DeWan Harris at Kansas. There are a handful of other very, very good point guards. Some score first point guards, some pass first point guards. But the best case scenario is that at the end of the year, when we're talking about the best point guards in the country, Ryan Nemhart is not just somebody tossed into that conversation. He's where you start it. That is the best case scenario for Ryan Nemhart. The best case scenario for Ryan Nemhart is that an effect that I have called the Ryan Woolridge effect in many episodes previously comes into play here for Ryan Nembhard, which is this. Transferring to Gonzaga, we have seen players up their efficiency. Typically, it is because they are going from being one of the most heavily guarded players on their roster to just a one of the players for Gonzaga's roster. Ryan Woolridge was the number one option for North Texas for three years before he came to Gonzaga. Malachi Smith fits into this. Rasir Bolton fits into this. I expect Steel Venters will fit into this. It's a little different with Ryan Nemhart because he came from a team that was already loaded with talent. They had Ryan Kalkbrenner. They had Baylor Shireman, Trey Alexander, Arthur Kaluma was on that team last year, a really, really talented, well-rounded starting lineup. And for Nemhard. Improving his efficiency won't be as simple as, hey, other teams aren't focusing on me as much in this offense. It's not, it, it doesn't translate quite as well. But in a best case scenario, perhaps because there's more up tempo, they're getting out in transition more, more easy lanes that way. We do see Ryan Nembhard's efficiency continue to improve in his third season. He's over 50% on two pointers, a mark he just missed last year. Instead of being just under 36, maybe he's 38. Maybe he's 40% from three. I don't think it's crazy for Ryan Nembhard to be 52, 55% on twos and 40% from threes. That's a fairly big jump from where he was last year, but he took a big jump from year one to year two. And doing it again in year three for an offense under a coach that has traditionally been one of the top five offenses in college basketball year after year after year, it is not crazy to imagine that Ryan Nembhard's numbers, uh, not just overall, but also efficiency-wise, tick up. The best case scenario for Ryan Nembhard is he leads Gonzaga in scoring is that he leads Gonzaga in assists. It's that he leads Gonzaga in steals. All of that is very possible. Ryan Nembhard averaging close to 18 points per game doesn't strike me as completely outside the realm of possibilities. We're talking best case scenarios here. So yeah, 18 points per game is probably not the likely outcome, but is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. 
there's no Drew Timmy on this roster. Graham E.K. is going to take a lot of touches. Anton Watson's probably going to get more touches. I think Steel Venters is a guy who's going to score a decent amount. Nolan Hickman probably gets some more touches too. Like it's going to, the, the love's going to get spread around a little bit in the post Drew Timmy era. But in a best case scenario for Ryan Nemphard, he is, he's got the keys and he is taking shots. He's getting good looks, whether it's out in transition, whether it's in, in pick and rolls, getting to his spots, getting open jumpers that way, attacking the basket, getting to the free throw line, whatever it may be. In a best case scenario for Andrew Nemhard, he averaged something like 18 points and six assists, maybe one and a half steals. Let's just tack that on there. And in a best case scenario for Andrew Nemhard, he makes his teammates better. This is what you want from PG1. This is what Andrew Nemhard was very good at. This is what a lot of Gonzaga point guards in the history of this program have been very good at. Specifically for Ryan, he allows Nolan Hickman to thrive in an off-ball role. Some of that's going to be up to Nolan himself, but Nolan being a secondary creator, being a catch-and-shoot shooter, as opposed to being the guy with the ball in his hands, should help. And in the best-case scenario, Ryan helps facilitate that for him. Nemhart also gives the shooters open looks. That includes Hickman. It also includes Steel Venters. It inclu could include some guys coming off the bench as well, Ben Gregg, Luka Krinovich, etc. And in a best-case scenario, Nemhart's ability to navigate the pick-and-roll and find cross a cross-court shooters for wide-open looks allows them to be more efficient and has this offense humming the way that it was when his brother was the leading point guard. The best-case scenario is that Ryan Nemhart also makes life easier for Anton Watson and Ben Gregg. If you remember last year, a lot of times Gonzaga had to get the ball out of the point guard's hands early in the shot clock because they weren't able, they were struggling with, with uh, pressure. In the best case scenario, Ryan Nembhard doesn't put that pressure on Anton Watson where he has to come get the ball 27 feet away from the rim and make something happen. Best case scenario is he's flowing the offense in a way that those guys can be in the spots that they want to be in. They can be looking for open shots. They don't have to be worried about, do we need to go help bail out our point guard who is struggling with pressure 37 feet away from the rim? The best case scenario for Ryan Nemhart is not only that he is the all WCC player of the year, it is that he is an all American. All American first team is the absolute best case scenario for Ryan Nemhart, but I would not say it if I did not think it was possible. And it is all WCC second or third team. Absolutely possible. I don't want to say likely, but possible. Without a doubt. Right now, if you're ranking the five best point guards in college basketball heading into the season, Ryan's going to be on your list. So for him to be in the All-American conversation is not a shock in any way. The best case scenario is that there's a legitimate concern that he leaves after the season despite his size, despite some of the limitations that might prevent him from being an NBA player because of how good of a year he has as a junior for Gonzaga. Well, what are the worst case scenarios for Ryan Nempard? Well, they don't look terrible because we know that Ryan Nemhart is very, very good. The worst case scenario for Ryan Nemhart is that he's asked to do too much offensively or feels the pressure to do too much offensively, and that leads to struggles. Ryan Nemhart's never been asked to be a team's leading scorer. I'm not sure that Mark View's goal for this team is for Ryan Nemhart to lead the team in scoring, but it doesn't seem impossible to me at all that he's asked to do that or that that feels like his role. And he's never done that before. Can he do that? Andrew was never asked to be Gonzaga's leading scorer. So it's a bit of a different role for Ryan. Maybe he does bump the scoring up to 15 points per game, but the efficiency drops. Instead of a, a third or a second consecutive year of improving his two-point field goal percentage, improving his three-point percentage, improving his free throw percentage, those numbers stagnate or even drop. He's back to 45% on twos. He's back to 31% on threes like he was as a freshman. Worst case scenario is those numbers regress as opposed to getting better after his first two years in the in the NCAA. The worst case scenario for Ryan Nemart is the defense just isn't good enough. Him and Nolan Hickman get picked apart by opposing backcourts because of their size, because of their length, because they're not at this point known as being particularly great defensive players. Again, Ryan Nemart is six foot. Andrew is six five. Big difference between those two guys. For Ryan to, he's going to have to be smart. He's going to have to use his size or use his, his body as best he can to avoid committing fouls while still being able to pick up talented guards like Aiden Mahaney, like Mongolian Mike, like Houston Millett at Pepperdine, Tyler Robertson at UP. There's good guards. And the WCC, of course, even better guards in the non-conference and in the NCAA tournament. In the worst case scenario, Nemhart is a liability defensively, and that makes it hard to play him in late game situations, which is a problem for Gonzaga as they don't really have a backup point guard on this team. Worst case scenario for Ryan Nemhart is the turnovers become an issue once again. 
Maybe it's uh, he's not used to running that up-tempo offense, which is definitely something he didn't really do at Creighton. Uh, Creighton was 143rd in pace last year. Gonzaga was 39th. The year before that, Creighton was 178th in pace. Gonzaga was fifth. That's a big difference. And we saw his his brother seamlessly transition into being a, a up-tempo, get the ball out in transition, get some easy buckets that way type of point guard. Andrew Nembhard single-handedly picked apart Memphis in that NCAA tournament game in that 21-22 season by getting the ball and going and getting out in transition and wearing those dudes down. In a worst-case scenario, Ryan can't do that because he hasn't been asked to do it in his first couple of years. I suspect that part of the reason he transferred is because he wants to do that, and I think he's probably more than capable of doing it. But in the worst-case scenario, that's not something that comes as easy to him as it did to Andrew. Worst case scenario for Ryan Nembhard, still probably all WCC second team. Maybe honorable mention is the absolute worst case scenario for him. And he's probably still coming back. And there's just kind of a hope of like, hey, maybe some of that, you know, maybe the year didn't quite go as well as we hoped it would for him in Spokane, but he'll be back in year four and maybe we'll we'll see a jump. Maybe he'll get those efficiency numbers back up. Maybe he'll adjust to being in an up-tempo role more, uh, more in year four than he did in year three uh, of his college career. We're going to close out the show discussing Nembhard's more realistic role and expectations somewhere in the middle of those best and worst case scenarios, as well as his future in Spokane beyond this season, all coming up after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The app, it's super easy to use, folks. You can bet on all sorts of stuff like spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, closing out the show today, continuing our player preview episode on Ryan Nemhard, Gonzaga's new point guard taken over for Nolan Hickman, who shifts to more of an off-ball role after transferring over from Creighton following his first two years with the Blue Jays. So looking at his realistic role, it's pretty easy. Ryan Nembhard's going to be the team's starting point guard. Ryan Nembhard's probably going to play 35 minutes per game because as a freshman at Creighton, he played 34.8 minutes per game. And as a sophomore at Creighton, he played 34 minutes per game. I Gonzaga doesn't have a backup point guard. Nolan Hickman is the backup point guard, but he's going to start at the two most likely, and he's going to play the majority of the minutes off the ball. I think the minutes that Ryan Nembhard is not on the floor will primarily be with Nolan Hickman at the point guard, or they will be in garbage time when it will be Joe Few, perhaps, or, you know, somebody like Luka Krinovich or Dusty Stromer getting to run the point guard uh, because Gonzaga's got all their backups in. But for the most part, the vast, vast majority of minutes this season for Gonzaga at the point guard position will come from Ryan Nembhard. And again, it's an easy comparison to make, but realistically, Ryan Edwards probably going to be asked to play a role similar to Andrews. He's going to be asked to push the pace when it is appropriate. When you when he grabs a rebound or somebody else gets a rebound and they get out in transition, they go, go, go. Gonzaga's always been good about that. And I think Ryan's going to be asked to, to lead the ship there, to make the decisions on, hey, this is a situation where we can push, we can make those passes up the court to guys who are streaking down the sidelines, or we're going to pull it back, we're going to run our half-court offense. Ryan will be tasked with making those decisions and will be asked to, whenever possible, push the pace. I think Ryan will also be asked to do a lot of pick and roll in the half court, something we saw Gonzaga kind of abandon at times last year because they didn't have the guard play to do it. They basically just got the ball to Drew Timmy at the high post, let him operate out of that. They don't have a player to do that with this year. Anton Watson could do that, but Gonzaga's most efficient offense is not giving the ball to Anton Watson 18 feet away from the rim. It's running side-to-side ball screen actions. It's running pick and rolls. Uh, it's driving dishes to shooters. All things that Ryan Nembhard is very capable of doing and that I think he's going to excel at. That is the role that will be asked of him. It will look like Gonzaga-led offenses from Andrew Nembhard. It really will. Getting off screens, finding finding a little space, driving all the way to the basket and getting contact and going to the free throw line or stopping in the lane and pulling up for a little 8, 9, 10-footer. Those kind of things are what our Ryan has in his arsenal and are things that we're going to see him exploit and opportunities for him to score through that kind of offensive sets. I think Ryan Nimpart is probably going to lead the team in scoring, although I think it's going to be close. Something like 15 points per game with Anton at 13 with EK in that same range as well steals maybe at like 10. Like, I really think that Gonzaga is going to have one of their more balanced scoring offenses. 
than we've seen in a while because we are in the post Drew Timmy era. But I think Ryan's probably the one at the end of the day who scores the most points this season. I also wouldn't be surprised if we do see an uptick in that efficiency. Something like 50-ish percent on twos, 40-ish percent on threes. Maybe it's more like 37% on threes, but it wouldn't shock me to see him be around 50 and 40 on those twos and three-point percentages. And honestly, it wouldn't shock me if he's all WCC player of the year. It's him or Aiden Mahaney. Those are the two guys who are competing for that award. Yes, Graham E.K. and Mitchell Saxon and Anton Watson, Tyler Robertson from UP, a handful of other guys are all in the mix and could certainly win it. But in my mind right now, the two players being identified as the likeliest candidates for that award are Ryan Nempart and Aiden Mahaney, and that's the correct two guys. It might come down to who actually wins the league. If Gonzaga wins, Nemhard might take that award. If St. Mary's wins, might be Mahaney. That might be all it takes to, to, to make that determination between those two guys. I also think All-American is legitimately possible for Ryan Nemhard. Like I said, needs to be the elite, elite, elite season for him. But if he averages 15 points and six assists and Gonzaga has a really good year, he's in that conversation, unquestionably. Look ahead of the future. For Ryan Nempard, I don't think that Ryan has the same NBA potential as Andrew for a simple reason. He's five inches shorter, at least listed as being five inches shorter. That's huge. I mean, it makes a massive difference in the modern NBA. The NBA is not looking at small guards anymore. They haven't for a while, but now they're like really anti-small guards. Guys like Luka Doncic are playing point guard. Like you don't have six foot, even two guys playing a lot of point guard unless they're freak athletes or elite shooters. You got to be Damian Lillard or Steph Curry or, a, you know, a John ja Morant, Derek Rose type, you know, in his, in his prime Derek Rose type or Scoot Henderson, for those of you who are Blazers fans, like Ryan Nembert is not those things. And while I think he's has the potential to be one of the best college point guards in the country this, I and mean, he already has been, he might be the guy this year. I don't see him leaving early. He's going to come back for a fourth year in Spokane. I think that's very, very likely. I think there's a chance that if he doesn't quite make All-American this year, he does it as a senior. If he doesn't win all WC or he doesn't win WCC Player of the Year this year, he gets it as a senior. I think he's going to spend two years in Spokane, just like his brother Andrew spent two years in Spokane. And I think he's going to continue to be one of the best point guards in college basketball for two consecutive seasons, giving Gonzaga a, there's a gap year in the middle, but a four-year reign of the Nemhard brothers being Gonzaga's point guard. And I think that we're going to see him be uh, similarly productive for two consecutive seasons in Spokane. Still don't know that the NBA will ever come calling for him, unfortunately, just because of that size. But I do think that he's going to be one of the most productive point guards in all of college basketball over the next two seasons. And I expect they're both going to happen in Spokane, Washington. That's going to do it for us today and for this week here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Special shout out to those everyday listeners and a special shout out to those of you who are not only everyday listeners, but you are also a member of our Discord channel. If you want to get involved in the Discord channel, you just have to click the link in the show notes on YouTube, in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. There's also links on Twitter as well. It is free to join. You get invited in. We're talking Zags 24-7, over 100 people in there right now. Really excited to get this thing going. We're going to do game watches, live game discussion throughout the season. So it's a great place to be as we get into actual college basketball all starting in just a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend. And until next time, as always, go Zags.